TJ Rogers here in the booth with Paul Chion getting ready for the first meter feature match of round 14. On the right side of the screen, we see Jerry Thompson with that black-red aggro. On the left side, of we've got Robert Pisano with red-green dinosaurs, the deck that we were just talking a little bit about. And uh, these players are 11-2, and two, which means that a loss knocks them out of contention. Right. So when doesn't necessarily... Uh, lock you into the into the top eight, but it puts you in, of course, very good position. Three losses basically means you are dead for the top eight. Yeah. And Jerry with kind of the ideal start here, being on the play, and also putting a lot of pressure on the board. Yeah, and Robert actually is on a mulligan as well, which is going to be a little bit less cards, especially on the draw. Could be yeah. a little bit of a setback. We've got Inventor's Apprentice and that Beaumont Courier, and Ether Sphere Harvester. The artifact synergies are coming in strong. Yeah, and... Jerry deciding to play the Aethersphere Harvester before attacks in case Rob Pisano does have a removal spell um, for the Bomad Courier, which and having an additional artifact in play means that the Apprentice is guaranteed to be a 2-3 on the battlefield. Yeah, Thrashing Brontotone coming down to the battlefield. Three mana, three, four. You can also pay a mana, egg, uh, sacrifice it to destroy an artifact or an enchantment. Does yeah, have some play. And Brontotone lining up really, really well with what's on the battlefield right now. Um, Robert can choose to use the Brontodon's effect to get rid of that Harvester at some point, but it's also just shutting down all of Jerry's offense. Um, Jerry is holding a Chandra Torch of Defiance, but was unable to find a fourth land to actually deploy it to get rid of that Brontodon. Yeah, and we did see that attack step really just the Aether Sphere Harvester, so a yeah. pretty significant slowdown. Yeah, Jerry really needs to find a fourth land, but there's a lot of other cards you could, of course, uh, find. You know, just even a card like Unlicensed Disintegration would, would go a long way here. And we've got a Sheltered Thicket that got cycled wow. and then followed up with Commune with Dinosaurs. Yeah, so really, really slow. Robert Persona really wanted to put a permanent onto the battlefield this turn, and, you know, this is kind of... Jerry does have a big window here. Basically, Robert took a turn off instead of playing a big creature, and if Jerry just has basically any way to interact with that Brontodon, he can get in for a lot of damage. Hush Up Oasis was the find off of that one, so it is going to be another land. We can expect Robert to make that drop next turn. Yeah, so Jerry did find a fourth land, meaning he can play that Chandra, use the Chandra to get that Brontodon off the board. Robert Pisano can still use the Brontodon to get the Aether Sphere Harvester off the board, but Jerry can then crack in for five with the Bomac Courier and a couple of those Inventor's Apprentices. One thing to note is that there is some haste from this Dinosaur's deck, so the Chandra may not be totally safe. That Regisaur Alpha does offer a little bit. There is haste, but at the same time, if Robert Persano plays a haste creature and attacks, that means he's tapping one of his creatures sideways, which kind of opens the door for Jerry to just attack back. And he's at six. Two yeah. Inventor's Apprentice and that Beaumont Courier coming in. You can see those three zombies lining up underneath it, ready for their turn. Right. So if Robert Persano, for example, played a Regisaur Alpha this turn... There we go. Oh, well, there it is. And he uses the token to get the Chandra off the board. Jerry Thompson can then choose to attack with all of the creatures, uh, which would then get Robert Pisano down to three. And that's what we're seeing right now. That dinosaur is going to swing in and eliminate the inevitability. And now it's Jerry Thompson with a Bomak Courier, two Inventor's Apprentice, four mana available this turn. Yeah, Jerry has a lot is of Is that a backup options. Chandra in hand? It, <laughs> it might actually be, yes. Oh, no. Yep. There's the Chandra. Eliminate that one. Swing for five. And what Bomac Courier's got four cards underneath it? Oh, yeah. So Robert's got to come up with something. Needs to answer both the Chandra and the board. Yeah, he needs, like, a sweeper to get rid of all the creatures on the board while also having his dinosaur survive. Yep. <sighs> not a good spot to be in. Yeah, and there's not a lot of life gain. Rob Pisano does have access to Death Gorge Scavenger, which isn't the main deck. But I don't think that two life is going to quite be enough here. And I don't think there's anything in the realm of a main deck sweeper that can handle all three of these creatures. The main yeah. removal is that struggle to survive. Right, right. No sweltering suns here no. uh, in the main deck. There's going to be another okay. register alpha. An well, attack there. But this just leaves Robert dead on board as long as Jerry remembers to attack with all of his creatures. He goes, I got another haster. All right, that's going to wrap it up. Game one going to Jerry Thompson blisteringly fast out of the gates. One missed land drop. Set him back just a touch, but that Chandra came down. Another one to follow it up. Just a, a rough time for Robert. Yeah, and, and this is just exactly what you want as the black-red aggressive deck. First of all, you want to win the die roll. You want to go first. You want to put pressure. And you also kind of are hoping for your opponent. You know, red decks are really good at just kind of punishing hiccups from opponents. And Robert, you know, he had a turn three Bronted on it, which did a good job of kind of mucking up the ground, but he couldn't follow that up with another permanent on turn four. And despite the fact that he had Registrar Alpha on turn five and six, still wasn't enough. Yeah. 
So heading into the sideboard for these two players, from the red-green dinosaurs deck, we haven't seen a whole lot of this one yet. We haven't been able to see it a ton. In the sideboard, we do have some options to, to have you know, a, an angle of attack on this black-red aggro deck. What's standing out to you? Well, it looks like Rapisano basically just looking at... Because sometimes when you look at people's main decks and sideboards, you're like, okay, you can kind of already identify what they think their bad matchup is. And looking at Rapisano's sideboard, I think he just doesn't want to play against too many red decks because he's got triple Chandra's Defeat, double Magma Spray, double Sweltering Suns in his sideboard. He's also got a Thrashing Brontodon, which I imagine he brings in just because it's a large body on turn three. And it also deals with some of Jerry's uh, evasive, like, Aethersphere Harvesters and stuff. And then he may or may not bring in that struggle to survive. Maybe it's just a little bit too slow. Yeah, and to touch on that a little bit, we've seen this Black-Red aggro deck sort of change up its game plan for games two and three, really kind of moving towards this more inevitable, difficult to deal with threats. What could Jerry be looking at to maybe go beyond those cards that are coming in? Yeah, and so this is always kind of, you, when you're sideboarding against the red aggressive deck, there's always this little like mini game when you're sideboarding. It's like, well, are they going to still have all their tree creatures? Do I still want a bunch of one-man removal spells in the matchup because oftentimes this red deck, because it has, it has such powerful threats that it can cyborg into that, that cost four and five mana, oftentimes on the cyborg, I can see Jerry just cutting his one drops. Maybe not the Bowmat Courier because Bowmat Courier is awesome, but he might, he might actually just choose to uh, cut the Inventor's Apprentices and go big. A lot of red decks have access to additional copies of Chandra Torch of Defiance. Uh, you could also bring, uh, Jerry also has Glorybringer and a Rekindling Phoenix. So he, and he even has an additional Canyon Slew in the sideboard just for this kind of slower transformational sideboard. So I can see Jerry looking to do that when he's on the draw. And then it gets interesting because if it goes another game and now Jerry's on the play, Will you sideboard so that you can kind of be aggressive again with your one drops? So Start getting into the mind games. Yeah, it's really hard sideboarding against this mono red deck because it has so many different angles of attack. Now that canyon slew in the sideboard is actually pretty interesting. Not too often do you get to actually see a land in that sideboard. Yeah, well, whenever you see a land in the sideboard, it's one of those like uh, moments where you, you just like, as a player, when you submit that, you just feel really smart. You're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got a land in my sideboard. I'm a pro. <laughs> but, you know, th that's just a common thing because, again, Jerry's looking to kind of slow the game down. He's bringing in more robust, expensive threats. And when you do that, you do actually want that additional mana source. And Canyon Slew is just kind of the perfect, perfect card for that. You're slowing the game down. If you're flooded, you can still cycle it. And it just, you know, gives you the mana that you need to kind of play these bigger cards. Absolutely. So these players are just about set for this game, too. Another thing that I'm a little bit curious about is the primary game plan of Rob's deck, this sort of very red-green beatdown game plan. How do you think that lines up against this deck? What's the, you know, d is that good enough as a best-case scenario? Is he going to have to pretty drastically change his game plan to sort of this reactive strat? Uh, well, the, the thing is, generally, when you see kind of the low to the ground aggressive deck go against kind of these bigger decks, all you really just need to do is kind of survive the early game because ultimately you can sur uh, you can stabilize with these bigger creatures, right? Jerry's got a bunch of one mana, one ones, and two threes. Imagine if Ra Pisana was on the play there, played a turn three Bronte on and then another creature on turn four, would have been a much different game, right? So I think, yeah, R Rob just wants to make sure he just gets a bunch of creatures onto the battlefield, trade as much as he can, and then just kind of take the game over with his larger creatures. Now, things change a little bit because, of course, you know, we have cards like Hazard at the Fervent. Uh, pretty hard to block that one. And I do expect Rob to likely sideboard out his Galtas. Now, that's the type of card that's good against other decks that primarily have cards like a Braid and other burn spells for removal. But when you're playing against a deck with multiple copies of Unlicensed Disintegration, going out of your way to play kind of this gigantic dinosaur um, might not be the kind of game plan that you want to deploy. All right, and we're going to see a turn one sheltered thicket followed up by a mountain into that Bulma Courier. Keeps coming down turn one, and it keeps running the show. It's going to be that hashtag Oasis from Robert. No turn to play yet. Yeah, but I imagine Robert probably has some kind of removal spell here. It's really hard to keep a hand that doesn't do anything on turn two or three unless he's got a Sweltering Suns. I do think I see an Abraid in that hand for Robert. We're going to get these triggers from the attack, and the Abraid is going to take down that Bulma Courier. Now is there... Okay, there is a second land coming down. It's that Canyon Slough. All yeah, right. Whoa. And no third land for Robert. This is just unfortunate. We saw something similar in that game one. He wasn't really able to utilize his fourth turn that well. Now we're seeing this third turn. 
right. really come up a bit short. And Jerry's just going to keep getting aggressive with this Beaumont Courier. He's going to throw down a Doomfall to take a look and see what he's missing out on. And as you can see, well, it looks like he kept the Galtazin, but as you can see, you know, Jerry did choose to kind of slow down the game. Boarding in something like a Doomfall means you're just kind of looking to go late. Yep, I see two Death Gorge Scavengers. Those are able to gain some life for Robert. I see that Chandra's Defeat, which is a pretty powerful removal. So I'm, ju I'm just going to assume that Galta's going to stay in Robert Pisano's <laughs> hand here. <laughs> I think he's likely going to go for one of the cheaper interactive cards. He's very far away from playing the Registrar Alpha and the Galta. So I imagine he's going to go for either the Death Gorge Scavenger and the Chandra's Defeat. And given that he does have redundancy here in the double Death Gorge Scavenger, I could see... Jerry go for a Chandra's defeat if he had something like a Chandra in his hand. Mm -hmm. The interesting part is that that Boma Courier isn't red. Yeah, Chandra's, def uh, Sh uh, Chandra's undefeatable. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> All right. It is going to be that Chandra's defeat that hits the uh, exile, actually. It yep. does not go to the graveyard. Robert needs a land oh here. Oh, no. Robert's passing it back, and Jerry is just going to be trying to capitalize on this moment. Think of that three-drop slot. There's a lot of four toughness for this Beaumont Courier, but that's not where we're at right now. Two Death Scourge Scavengers well, in that hand. Third land comes down. And Jerry actually missed his fourth land drop here as well. And Robert found his land, so might have a game. Unlicensed disintegration comes down. We do have an artifact, and it's back to Jerry. Oh, and Jerry draws another four drop. So actually both players kind of stumbling a little bit here. And Robert Pisano does have a backup Death Gorge Scavenger, which you can play this turn. Now, where does that decision process come in on when to activate the Beaumont Courier? Well, usually you just keep attacking until, you know, you've I ideally cast all the other spells in your hand. Beaumont Courier very powerful in, in the kind of these decks that are kind of lower, lower to the ground. Um, if Jerry feels like he's so far behind to the point where he absolutely needs to hit land drops and play more spells, he might... Uh, he might choose to crack the Bowmat Courier, but his hand is like double Chandra Glorybringer. It's going to be really hard for me to actually get, let go of those. So we're going to turn sideways with that Bowmat Courier. There's a Ronos the Indomitable on Robert's side of the battlefield. There's a reason it's not blocking, and that's because it just can't. Right. I'm sure it would love to get into the fray. But you do need to have another creature with power 4 or a greater for it to be able to actually start entering into this combat phase. Yeah, and the Ronus actually synergizes very well with cards like Galta Primal Hunger because it is indestructible. It does lower the mana cost of Galta by 5, so for the low, low cost of 7 mana, he can now play a 12-12 uh, Trampler. It's a bargain at twice <laughs> the price. <laughs> Not too bad. Death Court Scavenger comes down, and looks like we might have a little bit more to go. Exiling his own Death Court Scavenger. That actually ended up uh, dying to that unlicensed disintegration. Another one from Jerry. Yeah, <sighs> and Jerry's... Uh, this this Bowman Curry is just looking at so many cards. It looks like Jerry found another land, so he has a couple of actual... Um, couple decent options here. We talked about that Chandra that he drew, but he also has a glory bringer, and he can just choose to be aggressive here and pressure Robert's life total while he's kind of, you know, on the, on the back foot. So I could see him just playing out the land and playing glory bringer. Alternatively, I could see him play out the Chandra and leave a mana open so that he can cash in that Bomat Courier for the t seven trillion cards that are underneath it right now. Right. Or six, same thing. Okay, so he, went, he, he decided to go with the glory bringer here. And now Robert... Robert's at seven. Yeah, and this, this, this thing, this makes sense from Jerry's side just because it's like, okay, well, you can kill my Bowman Courier that has all the cards in it, and I get to lose a bunch of this value, but I still got this Glorybringer on the board that you need to deal with as well. Yeah, and the Abrade doesn't answer that very well, so we're yeah. going to take that one down while Jerry has no mana. All oh, those cards, though. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like to pay a red and draw seven? <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, P pretty strong effect, pretty strong effect. <laughs> <laughs> so it is still the glory bringer out and about. Two green mana from Robert means that there's likely not too much uh, interaction on that side of the field. A Hazaret uh. and a Braid, and that is going to be the win for Jerry in two. Throws down this creature, gets down to one card by using that Abrade to eliminate the only thing that stands in his way. The game's done. That creature didn't even die. Yeah. That creature was indestructible. He just needed to Abrade yeah. something. Hazaret has a little line of text that makes it so that you need to have at least one card or less in hand for it to actually attack. And so Jerry did have a legal target in that Ronus the Indomitable, which was just kind of a 5-5 indestructible can't attack or block creature. Yeah, so two gods in play. One of them got to do their thing. The other one fell a little bit short at the hands of those unlicensed disintegrations. Yeah, and Robert Pisano, like, yeah, he didn't really get to 
show off what his deck can do. A uh, little unfortunate that you know he got he got stalled on two lands. He got stalled on two lands. Kept the two lander. He had some interaction. He did have you know a couple of three drops as well. So it's just one of those things where you keep this hand and uh, if you if you find a land, you get there. If not, you know sometimes uh, you're just gonna get run over. Yeah, absolutely yeah. can be a struggle with uh, with some of those decks. So I think we're gonna have an opportunity as well to uh, have Jerry show up for a bit of an interview uh, right after that match win. He's now s continuing to be X and 2. He's going to be heading into round 15, potentially in that running for top 8. Yeah, really, really good position here. Just uh, probably, probably he's going to need to win out his last round as well, but, you know, at least you're still alive. Yeah, yeah. and that's the good place to be. All right, so it's time to head on down. Let's say hi to Jerry. How's it going, Jerry? It's TJ Rogers here with Paul Cheon. How's it going, guys? Oh. Another fantastic day. Good to see you again. We haven't had a whole lot of opportunity to work together since uh, Albuquerque, but it's fantastic seeing you again showing up at uh, these tables playing that red deck that you've all been doing pretty well with. Yeah, it's nice to be here, and um, I'm certainly in good company. You know, John Rolf, uh, Nathan Smith, uh, they have another buddy. There's Malcolm and Matt Severa. We're all like, uh, a lot of us are like X3 or better, basically. So. So building this deck, was that a pretty collaborative team effort? We were able to hear a little bit earlier about some of the interactions between John and Nathan. Tell me a bit about how that team dynamic was coming together with this deck. Yeah, so uh, John and Nathan work together. I believe they're roommates, and uh, I'm friends with them, but we don't work together all that much, although I'm trying to change that because these, these two guys are just great at magic. They always have like a very solid take on the metagame and everything, and... Uh, I knew that Matt Severo was working on a similar deck, so like, he, he contacted me, and we just all kind of, like, talked to each other. So we're all playing, like, slightly different builds and everything. We're all kind of doing our own thing, but it was mostly, like, Nathan's brainchild, and then we went from there. Fantastic. You had a couple of uh, falters there. You missed your fourth land drop. Probably felt pretty good, though, when your opponent started missing theirs. Oh, yeah, e especially after I saw his hand with the Doomfall. Uh, it's just, like, I know exactly what he has and for the most part it's like not a lot of interaction so if i hit land four i'm gonna start playing like these big cards that he can't deal with so uh even, even if like something goes wrong like i still have a bow mackery with five cards under it you know so I, I like my spot for sure yeah so what was kind of the thought process of kind of going into a second color for black what are kind of the advantages that you get as opposed to kind of your traditional mono red deck well mono red has this problem against walking ballista where uh, Ballista on 2 buys them a bunch of time, and walking Ballista on 4 will almost assuredly just kind of like take out uh, whatever board position you've assembled. So I basically wanted to play a creature deck that had a little bit more toughness, and Inventor's Apprentice is the best way to do that. And uh, Scrap Heap Scrounger also gives you a little bit of staying power, and then once you're going down like the Artifact Train, you're like, okay, well I also have Ballistas for the Mirror Match, which is nice, and you get things like Unlicensed Disintegration, which are good against like the random green decks and Scarab Gods and stuff. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Good luck in your uh, next round. You're X and 2 right now, so hopefully we'll be able to see you in the top 8. Uh, hopefully. I'll need it. All right. So that is, uh, was our first match of that round 14, seeing that red deck up against it. And uh, we're going to have more magic coming our way in just a moment right after these messages.
Coming back in round 14 here at GP Seattle, TJ Rogers with Paul Chion, and we have got our time walk match all set up. It is going to be Charles Wong up against Gan Yan. Uh, Charles, actually kind of a hometown hero, a player from the Seattle area, is currently X and 1, and looking to make it into that top 8. We saw a local Seattle player defend the house yesterday here at Seattle, looking to run it back and do it twice. Yeah, back-to-back -back Seattle. That would be nice. you got to keep the trophies <laughs> in the city, but on the That's other right. side of the battlefield, we've got Gan, who's actually from China, and there's been a lot of support for this player in the area. We've got some players who are making sure that uh, everybody back home can be aware of how they're doing. So... Not the only pace that's uh, got people back at home rooting for them. Yeah, for sure. And down into the field, we have got Blue Red God Pharaoh's Gift starting off with a fanatical firebrand off of the mountain on the left side of the field. It is Ganyan on mono red. And one, one kind of interesting thing about this mono red deck is oftentimes the colorless land that the mono, mono red deck will play is, uh, is the Sun Scorched Desert. Give yeah. you a little more reach, a little more damage, but actually Ganyan is, has opted to go for three scavenger grounds and grasping dunes. And we've actually seen Ganyan no turn one play, no turn two play. This fanatical firebrand has been uncontested from uh, Charles, and it is going to be a champion of wits. Yeah, so Gan actually has a slightly more expensive mono red deck. He's playing the full four copies of Hazareth the Fervent to go along with four copies of Rekindling Phoenix. So. I imagine there have been a decent amount of games where he just doesn't have the ability to attack with turn four with Hazard at the Fervent. But that th doesn't mean it's necessarily wrong, as he is currently 13-0. and 0. And we see the Lightning Strike take down that Champion of Wits, taking the opportunity to uh, clear up the board, and it is going to be the Crash that comes in. No need for exerts. That one is going to be uh, untapping next turn, ready to swing again. Looks like it's the fourth mana here for Charles. A lot of blue, not a whole lot of red. It's a Beaumont Courier joining the field. These one drops have been just kind of the name of the game for these blue red god pharaohs gift decks, <laughs> or just any deck with mountains. For, uh, you know, just they're just like, hey, well, I'm a red deck, and I'm looking to either do this combo thing, or just just beat you down. And all the decks have basically just been kind of playing four copies of each of these. Sure, running mountains, you got to deliver the mail and uh, tap to ping. Right. Champion of the Wits comes down again. We have got Mountain hitting the graveyard. We have also got the Vizier of Many Faces yeah, in easy. there. You have Vizier, Main and Feast is in the, in the graveyard. There's two creatures in the graveyard. I believe Charles actually is holding a copy of Gate to the Afterlife in hand. So he's pretty happy with just looking to trade here if he, if he can. Mm -hmm. And actually, both of these cards are fan fantastic at just putting themselves in the graveyard. Right. You know, the, the Fanatical Firebrand has its own ability. The Beaumont Courier, it's a little bit riskier because it does require discarding that hint. But if you can play out that Gate to the Afterlife, play out your fifth mana, you can get it in there. Yeah, and look, you know... It looked like Gan didn't have anything to do early, but he did actually curve out. He didn't have the one drop, but he did have a two, three, and a four here. Yep. This rekindling Phoenix is going to be kind of difficult to deal with. Um, this basically just kind of shuts down Charles from attacking with his creatures. Yeah, and it's a four, three in the air, so just as good at attacking as it is at blocking and applying pressure to this deck that, you know, the more time you give it, those four fours are going to become a problem. So Charles could choose to just kind of put that gate to the afterlife there and just start using it to churn through his creatures mm -hmm. to fill up the graveyard until he actually finds the God Pharaoh's gift. Another thing in mind is that Warkite Marauder in hand. Combine that with the Fanatical Firebrand. We've seen it before. It does offer an answer to this, uh, the Rekindling Phoenix. It does offer an answer to any future Hazarets. It does give the deck a whole lot of play, maybe considering going for that this turn. Yeah, he has that. And if you notice, you actually get to see a little bit of Gan uh, Ganyan's tech here with that Grasping Dunes on the battlefield, can use that Grasping Dunes to deal with the, the Warkite Marauder. That's true, that Grasping Dunes a little bit uh, outside of the norm. Oh, and look, Charles getting aggressive here, playing out that Gate to the Afterlife, using the Fanatical Firebrand to sh target his own Champion of Wits, which then allowed, it him, allowed him to draw a card and discard a card. And does he actually have six creatures in his graveyard? I'm counting up, I think, six. We've got the Vizier of Many Faces, the Fanatical Firebrand. That just put us up to, to the six that we needed. Yeah, so he's on six, so he actually can play a God Pharaoh's Gift. Gate to the turn. Afterlife happens and we are about to be seeing them come out there's a combat celebrant coming down you take this one you get another combat step right and the question now becomes what creature is he going to get out of his graveyard that's a, good a lot point. of good options he does have that champion of witch which you can which you can use to kind of uh, fuel up his hand again 
Yeah, I guess the tricky part with uh, going in with that Combat Celebrant is that the Rekindling Phoenix can get in the way of it. You'll get your other attack step. You'll get, uh, you know, another card out of that graveyard, but at the cost of that Celebrant, maybe right. waiting to go with something more like the uh, Marauder to team up with it yeah. as it goes on. Oh, Looks nope, nope. Celebrant it is. That's where we want to be. We're attacking with the Beaumont Courier and with the Comet Celebrant. That's going to untap, get another card underneath this, and that other attack is going to put a card under the Beaumont Courier as well. Right. And looks, I believe, can that Courier currently can choose to block here, right? He can block the... Uh, the Comet Celebrant? Or, or the Beaumont Courier. Oh, or the Beaumont Courier. Yeah, it's a 4-4 four, four and a 1-1. One, one. one of them you do lose that Rekindling Phoenix, but you would get the Elemental, which can right. bring it back the following turn. The big question is, what's this second combat going to look like? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah, he, choosing to trade with the Celebrant, just preserve the life total. And, again, we'll get an egg. Yep. So now it is time for the second combat. This Boma is ready to be in action again. There is just the elemental to get in the way of it, and I doubt that it will. That wasn't... All right, okay. looks like it might be just yeah. setting up the graveyard for future turns. Draw four, discard oh, and two. another Celebrant. <sighs> that Combat Celebrant is really powerful. We saw before, having two of them combined means that exerting it is actually no longer a cost. Right. Because then the next one to do so will untap the previous one. Mm. So we've got an attack in for five. This Champion of Wits is a 4-4. Four, four. We've also got the Beaumont Courier, which has been really here since the beginning. And yeah. it's continuing to, to do its thing. And Gan can't really choose to block here. You don't want to block with that elemental. You want to return that Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we're kind of off to the races here. And, and Gan really needs um, a braid here to actually be able to, I think, stand a chance. Yeah, take down that God Pharaoh's Gift now while you can, while there's still just a 4-4 and a 1-1 on the battlefield. The longer this goes, especially with that combat celebrant in the graveyard, yeah. things Ooh, are moving. And he's also got a Scavenger Grounds, okay. which, is, which is also very, very nice against, of course, God Pharaoh's Gift. Actually, I think he kept the Combat Celebrant in hand alongside a uh, Fanatical Firebrand. Mm. That Again. Scavenger Grounds is pretty powerful against the strategy, though. Yes. Again, weighing his options here. He does have a, the Rekindling Phoenix, which returned to the battlefield. It currently does have haste. Mm -hmm. And I guess he's deciding whether or not he wants to be defensive with this. But I think you just want to kind of put the pressure on Charles here. You're on the side of, of getting in the swing and making sure Well, yeah, sure because on the following turn, you do have that on-crop crasher, which you can untap with. Sure. And uh, you have a lot of draws in your deck, which could also, you know, if you get, get in for the guaranteed four points of damage here, you have a lot of draws in your deck that could basically just potentially win the game. And having access to that scavenger grounds gives you an enormous amount of just, you're right. not going to get hit next turn, at yeah. least. Also, I don't think it's unreasonable to just go for the abrade on the God Pharaoh's Gift. Charles Wong already discarded one of the God Pharaoh's Gifts. Mm-hmm. He's so that doesn't leave a whole lot of room to right. do it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he might he might wait before Charles kind of goes to his pre-combat. Well, he does again. He does have access to that scavenger ground, so he can just use the scavenger grounds instead to kind of prevent the Godfather's gift from doing its thing. Now, that Combat Celebrant might come down, but it does not have haste, so it's going to have to wait a turn if it wants to try and get into this game. I think Charles kind of, you know, you, you can't rely on those creatures in the graveyard anymore. Yeah. This is a very, very close game here. Yeah, 8 to 9. Is that a Walking Ballista I see as well? Yeah, he does have a, he does have a Walking Ballista, so he can play a 2-2 Walking Ballista to go with that Fanatical Firebrand. Um, he's also got the combination of Fanatical Firebrand plus Warkite Marauder in the yard. Mm -hmm. So if he chose to get back the Warkite Marauder with the God Pharaoh's Gift, he can get rid of that Rekindling Phoenix. And with the Abrade happening, that is going to remain in the graveyard going for this before the combat step happens. Right. It, it, yeah, the Fanatical Firebrand combined with that, it, it does mean that two of the creatures that Gan has could be removed Right. because of that uh, Walking Ballista as well. Doesn't look like we're going for that just yet, though. Yeah, so, Char uh, so Gan, I mean, if Charles chooses to play the 2-2 Walking Ballista, he does have the option to shoot down both the uh, Oncrop Crasher and the, the Earthshaker Kenra, meaning that Gen only has that Phoenix, and maybe the, maybe we get into a potential racing situation. Boma Courier and a 4-4 cha Champion of Wits against the Rekindling Phoenix? Yeah. Might be off to the races. Charles is keeping an eye on this Warkite Marauder, though. 
I don't, th I don't think playing defense against necessarily uh, the rekindling Phoenix is where you want to be. So mm -hmm. looks like Charles is choosing for the choosing to go with the aggressive route here. That last card that we can see in Gan's hand is a mountain. Right. So does have access to both of these lands, which do offer some utility. Can put a minus one minus. And one Charles counter. is actually one point short here. This this attack gets Gan down to four life. And he's got the 2-2 Walking Ballista and a Fanatical Firebrand, but that can only get him down to one. <laughs> oh, no. So, one is not zero. Not yet, anyway. No, not yet. Not yet. So the Earthshaker Kenra is also going to be coming down next turn. Even if that one dies, we don't have quite the mana to bring it back, though a land off the top would enable that, but that's not really where we're at. It is going to be that Walking Ballista. It's on two. Not activating it just yet maybe waiting to just see how this turn plays out because when you've got three damage and your opponent's at four yeah oh this is really interesting i think okay i think G gandrew a lightning strike so so this game is incredibly close gan could even get charles down to one life as well if he attacks with the phoenix and uses the <laughs> lightning strike so so i mean it really depends on kind of i guess the other card in, in gan's hand he's all he also of course has the the Grasping Dunes on the battlefield. What you could do as well is go for an attack all out, see what Charles does. Having the Grasping Dunes as well as the Lightning Strike means that he could kill the Champion of Wits. Right, right. Definitely, but definitely has that as an option. So, yeah, very, very intense here. Um, Gan could also choose to uh, move through the combat step and see if Charles uses the Walking Ballista uh, to get the Oncrop Crasher off the battlefield. Mm-hmm. That is also something to consider. But if that happens, if Charles d chooses to basically sacrifice one of his creatures to get the Oncrack Pressure off the battlefield, he still has the option of blocking the Earthshaker Kenra or using one of the counters to, to deal with the Earthshaker Kenra. And if he does do that, uh, then he's only going to be taking that four damage. And in conjunction with Gan's Lightning Strike, again, not quite. One. Down to one. I do like, just given the number of 4-4s four that we've seen this weekend from Godfrey's Gift, Grasping Dunes and Lightning Strike are a pretty happy uh, duo yeah. when it comes to dealing with the ones that you just couldn't before. Yeah, and especially just Grasping Dunes. If, you know, this, uh, this blue-red Godfrey's Gift, like, we've seen it all over the place, and Grasping Dunes just an excellent way to deal with Warkite Marauder. That's a great point. Looks like we're going to go after the Walking Ballista. So forcing the action here because a mi putting a minus one, minus one counter on a creature with plus one, plus one counters effectively just removes one of the counters. So this is kind of putting Charles to the, to the test. It's you need to use your walking ballista here to get rid of my own crop crasher, which I think is what's likely going to happen here. Hmm. So he, he can use the walking ballista to get the crasher off the board. Yep. Then Gan will likely attack with both of his creatures and Charles then will choose to block with the fanatical firebrand. But that still puts you in a position where you're at four and there's five power on the other side of the battlefield. Right. The question is, does Charles have... Yeah, I mean, Charles also is looking at that champion of wits, right? So that is already lethal by itself. Exactly. We're just oh, going to get oh, aggressive okay, now. Okay, so Charles just got rid of the minus Let's one, go minus for one counter. So, Okay. Hmm. I suppose using the counter, it means that, you know, that's your only shot for one because you could yeah. you either use both of them or you keep a creature. So one of the creatures currently cannot block. So Charles, yeah, still has a reasonable play where he can just block and then, yeah, p ping the Earthshaker Ken right here. And then he's just currently dead on the attack back. Yeah, I'm not certain wh what uh, Gen has as an option. If that is that Lightning Strike, it's going to be... I don't see a whole lot of ways out of this with that Champion of Wits there. And it, that looks like a Lightning Strike to me. Yeah. I think I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's, that's going to be game. picking it up. So on to game two, Charles versus Gan. We've got a mountain turn one, followed by a fanatical firebrand coming out of the gates, red hot. Yeah, and Gan now has access to the full four copies of a braid after cyborg to kind of help deal with that God Pharaoh's gift. That's a excellent point. Spire Bluff Canal for Charles. No turn one play. It's another fanatical firebrand. Both of these decks playing it, even though they have completely different game plans, and it's a walking blister that comes down yeah. for one. And Firebrand, just I, th I think just like on both sides, seems like an excellent card in the matchup. The Firebrand just being able to deal with, you know, the Bowman Courier, Champion of Woods, the Celebrant, mm -hmm. just has a lot of, lot, of, uh, lot of targets. Yep. So we've got an attack in for two, no blocks yet from Charles. It's going to be that Warkite Marauder, and an Abrade takes it down immediately. Untaps on Gan's side. And it's a missed land drop out of Charles Wong. Mm-hmm. 
This is our undefeated player with this mono red deck. And it is going to be a Beaumont Courier to join it. This is three attackers again into this lonely walking I think ballista. we're getting a block sack here on the Beaumont Courier. Looks like we're going to let that exiled card just be. I think oh. I see a Hazret in hand. Oh, but not a lot of pressure here. Again, if Gen had a big creature to play that turn, that would have been really difficult for Charles to come back from. But mm -hmm. now, Charles did find land number three. Gate to the afterlife. A braid takes it down again. Okay. This disruptive deck has and been doing is that its an thing. Attacking Hazret? Yeah. Seven damage. It's a two-turn two turn clock. clock. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we timed that perfectly. We, we, we had the, the fingers with the 3-2-1 and everything. We synced up our watches beforehand, oh, and yeah, that's yeah. going to be a win for Gan. On to game three. Blazing fast. It's time for Charles to see if he can defend Seattle in this <laughs> final game. Yeah, but keep in mind, of course, even if Charles does lose, he will be sitting at 12-2, and two, and that still puts him in position to potentially top eight next round. That's a great point. But Gan Yan currently, with this win, it will 100% lock him in. Even with a the loss, there's a very good chance that he's already locked for top eight oh, yeah. if he can get that draw in the last round. Going 13-0 and 0 is just amazing. It is, it is. I mean, Gan could also just try to win all the rounds Thanks. and just, just, just run the 18-0. Bragan writes alone. Oh, yeah. So it's going to be the Fanatical Firebrand coming down and <laughs> backed up by another. They're on the same wavelength, these two. Yeah. Only play one way. <laughs> I mean, I'm a fan of mountains myself. Yeah. It's hard to disagree. Two mana, and it's actually a pass, holding up what looks to be in a braid as opposed to going for more pressure. <laughs> one fanatical firebrand points at Charles's. Charles's then points at Gan. It's one point of damage that way. And oh. now it's going to be a Beaumont Courier joining the battlefield. Yeah. So Gan chose to use a firebrand, knowing that he would take a point of damage, but this guarantees that that Beaumont Courier will be able to get in... Uh, get in for an attack here and the is wow. there no third land oh no i don't think so it's an on crop okay. crasher we're getting in for four and things are starting to tilt towards game and we've just seen just time and time again this red deck just be able to kind of punish pu punish some of these draws yeah i think i see a fourth man available as well it's another attack for four a braid does eliminate that one from the battlefield is it phoenix time oh no mm. Charles heading in turn. I still don't see. Yeah. Oh, this is going to be rough. Yeah. No third land still. Blue red not, not very well equipped to deal with a rekindling phoenix. No, and he can answer at least that singular Beaumont courier. But this rekindling phoenix is on an open field right yeah. now. Yeah. There's a glory bringer in hand too. No, oh, why not? Ah, do yeah. we have the fifth mana? Maybe not. Which means he probably just has two great spells in hand. So. <laughs> it's not lands; it's spells. Yeah. Also has that Grasping Dunes could also just force any kind of pressure from that uh, Walking Blist eventually. Right. And Charles, can at this point, he doesn't want to give Gan the option of cracking that Bowmat Courier. So with the trigger on the stack, mm -hmm. Charles is going to use the Walking Ballista to deal one damage to the Bowmat Courier. And Gan likes his hand, likes that Glorybringer, so has no intention of discarding it. And Charles <laughs> still stuck on two lands. Fanatical Firebrand hits the battlefield. It's able to do something, but yeah. not a whole lot. It's another swing in for four, followed up by Hazaret. Can't attack with it yet, but... Three cards in hand. Does give you that inevitability. Mm-hmm. Even the bad cards, now you can just start throwing them. Yeah. So and it's gate to the afterlife after this third and land. And this is just game. Attack with the Phoenix. Discard a card to, the, uh, to Hazaret, and that will be lethal. Yep. Can, yeah, actually even just gaining the life from that <laughs> fanatical fire. Now, now we're just making sure. We're like, okay, okay, what's happening here? What's happening here? There's a hit for four. And let's see if this Hazaret can just close out the game. The, the fanatical fire can gain Charles one life. <laughs> Throw yeah. of glory bringer two. So that is going to be Gan coming away, remaining undefeated. 14 and zero. About to head into the 15 round, maybe looking to just go undefeated throughout the entirety of the Swiss. Yeah, and we've seen we've seen this a few times at previous GPs. What once you're 14, you know, you're com comfortably sitting at the top. No matter what, you're going to be the one seed in the top eight. A lot of we've seen a lot of players just kind of kind of go for the undefeated. So I would it wouldn't surprise me if uh, that's what uh, Yen chose to do for the next. And round. with a red deck, especially being on the play throughout the top eight, is going to be an enormous advantage. Yeah, it just. A anytime you're looking to kind of play these aggressively slanted decks, being on the play is so, so important. And so Gan's got to be thrilled to kind of lock in his top eight slot 
and also have the potential to go undefeated for the whole tournament. Absolutely. Should yeah. be uh, pretty exciting. Looks like we actually do have some more time walk coming our way here. And we're actually going to be jumping into game two. John Rolf on that black red aggro deck we saw from Jerry. Jeremy Fry on more of this blue red Godfrey's gift that has just been the talk of the tournament. Yeah, we've, we've seen this matchup a fair amount now. Fanatical Firebrand gets yeah. in turn one. It's starting to feel all too familiar. Card of the tournament, Fanatical Firebrand? Absolutely. <laughs> So from John's side, again, this is the uh, very close to the same deck that we saw Jerry take a win with. And Inventor's Apprentice is joining the battlefield. Not a whole lot of action in this game, too. We saw game one go to Jeremy Fry. Yeah, and earlier in our interview with, uh, with Jerry Thompson, they were talking about how just they didn't like having a deck just chock full of one toughness creatures. And that's the reason why they decided to go uh, into black so that they could play Inventor's Apprentice. And you see it right here. Even as a one-two, kind of just putting the brakes on that fanatical firebrand. Yeah, now keeping this hand for John is uh, a little bit of an interesting choice. I'm really curious to see what cards are in this hand that is prompting a, a keep that didn't seem to have a whole lot of gas yeah. to kick things off. Yeah, certainly not kind of not one of the more aggressive draws. No third land from John either. His hand did just have his hand does just kind of top out at three mana, and, he, and it was a two lander. I think and I see two unlicensed disintegration, an ether sphere harvester, and a PNLR. Exactly. So certainly a lot of good cards, and he did have you know the one drop. So or so he did have the walking ballista. So mm -hmm. I think it's you know it's borderline, but reasonable. From Jeremy, it's the third land coming down. What can we do with it? Looks like a champion of wits to me. Drawing two, discarding two. Pretty powerful effect, yeah. even without the four. Yeah, and John now really needs to find that third land. If he can find that third land, he can either he can he can run out the Ethosphere Harvester, and then he can freely attack with those Inventor's Apprentices as well. True, because then they will be up to being the two three. Right. Jeremy's tapped out, so you're not as worried about something in the realm of you know an abrade anything like that. Yeah, and if he fails to find a land, I could potentially see him. Is that a tapped land? Uh, I, think, I, th I think it was. I think that might be a Dragon Skull Summit with no mountains and no swamps. Right, right. So I th it, there, it is possible for John to just go with a Walking Ballista here. If he plays the Walking Ballista, he can use it to... I guess he could use it to shoot the Champion of Wits and then just attack for two because both of the apprentices can attack through the Fanatical Firebrand. He could also just kind of sit on it and just be a little bit more uh, just wait till maybe he hits a fourth land to play a 2-2 walking ballista as well but there it is the dragon's goal summit no swamps no mountains in a deck like this unfortunately it's going to be a tapped land and the walking ballista joins the party I think if John's plan is to attack with the apprentices he probably just wants to use the ballista to get the champion of wits on the board otherwise um, otherwise Jeremy can choose to block the inventor with the champion of wits and then use the Firebrand to shoot the Walking Ballista. And then that oh. just kind of forces John to already use the Ballista anyways. Looks like that might be close to the realm that we're seeing. Yeah. We're seeing Jeremy line up these blocks. Right, so now Jeremy, yeah, Jeremy can just, yeah, run the double block and then just use the, the fire. Now he takes no damage. He, you know, it's in like this very similar situation because he's, he's going to run, run out the blocks and John basically, let's see. I mean... Jeremy is almost assuredly going to use that Firebrand to get the Ballista off the board. I'm curious as to why it's kind of hanging back right now. Is there... I'm not really familiar with if there's any reason why he'd really want to keep this card on board right now. Huh. So he, he lets... Okay, so he, they let... So now damage has happened. Jeremy can use the Firebrand, and now the Inventor's Apprentice is going to die because damage has happened. So now John just lost an additional creature here um, when I think he could have prevented it. Yeah, I'm a little bit curious about just the choice to do this after combat as well. Going for a pre-combat means that you don't take that damage and you also get that walking blista off the field before the combat happens. Ooh, and we, we see some nice little sideboard tech here in Padim. <sighs> that All your excellent. artifacts have hexproof, but Padim uh, does not have hexproof itself, so you can use, John can use unlicensed disintegration to get that off the board. And now John is in you know, a reasonable spot. Found the land, kind of came out the gates a little bit slow, but he can now start deploying all the, the great three drops that he has in hand. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's too concerned about the team right now. So 
maybe maybe goes with the Ether Sphere Harvester. That's that's like that's the card that's kind of more or less guaranteed to get in for damage next turn. Going for P and Alar, it does get okay. that artifact on the table as well. Right. Yeah, so both of those cards get the artifact on the board. The Harvester will get in for more damage on the following turn because mm -hmm. this Padim is kind of keeping things at bay. But John could also be setting up this this uh, this play so that on the following turn he can play an unlicensed disintegration on Padim and attack. And it's an Ether Sphere Harvester for Jeremy Fry. That lifelink ability on it, huge against these red decks. Yeah, now this is actually kind of annoying for John because now. John can't use that unlicensed disintegration, unlicensed disintegration to get the Harvester off the board until he gets rid of that Padim first. Yeah, that X-Proof on it is going to be unfortunate. Taking down the Padim, it leaves just the Aether Sphere Harvester on the bright side. There are no other creatures on the board currently, but you do see him crew that up before it leaves the field. You do have a flying 3-5 against a Thopter, an Inventor's Prentice, and a Pia. John's not going to swing into yeah, it. So now John... Doesn't have an attack this turn, but kind of hoping Jeremy doesn't follow it up with another creature this turn. Or he also has that unlicensed disintegration um, trophy that, that mage. He can play next turn. So, so this trophy mage, when it enters the battlefield, you search your library for an artifact, converted mana cost three, put it into your hand. We see him go for this gate to the afterlife. We've seen this card before. This is going to be his way to get into this God Pharaoh's gift. Also, gains a little bit of life against this aggro deck. Yeah, it's uh, Trophy Mage has a couple of really nice targets. As you can see, they're both on the battlefield. You have the Aether Sphere Harvester to go with the Gate to the Afterlife. And how many? What's the creature count here in the graveyard? We got looks like four looks to like me. Looks like four here. So he's very, very close. Mm -hmm. The Trophy Mage is pretty happily uh, either on blocking duty or the Aether Sphere Harvester might get removed by that unlicensed disintegration at this point. And the one nice thing about John using the unlicensed disintegration on the Aether Sphere Harvester is that Aether Sphere Harvester, while it's a vehicle, it is not a creature in the graveyard. Mm -hmm. So it will not count towards the gate to the afterlife. It's true. Keep the count at four. My combat, maybe see if you can get uh, Jeremy to also crew it up before those blocks happen. I mean, at this point, too, Jer you're not like ahead enough. Jeremy's not ahead enough where he can, like, maybe just play around it. I think you just crew and hope you don't. It's. Un it's you know, it's not super likely that John has another disintegration, so you just kind of kind of play the numbers, the percentages, and just, yeah, this is a turn where I'm just going to crew my Harvester. If you have a removal spell, I can still loot. You know, the Gate to the Afterlife will still trigger. Mm -hmm. You gain a life, draw a card, discard a card, and get one step closer to looking for that God Pharaoh's gift. Once it happens, though, i got to say, having a 4-4 Padim does sound pretty appealing with a God Pharaoh's <laughs> gift uh, to keep those card draw happening. Definitely. There's the disintegration, taking down the Aether Sphere Harvester, this is going to be a decent swing here. He, Jeremy does gain a life. He's going to get to loot. But you do have the artifact for this Inventor's Apprentice, so it's a 2-3. You've got this 2-2-P in Alar. This Thopter sort of negated by that gate to the afterlife, but still a pretty right. sizable swing. Creature count is now at 5. So if Jeremy finds a card like a Fanatical Firebrand or a Walking Ballista, he can immediately put a creature into his graveyard. So that's what Jeremy's looking for, a way to put creature number 6 into his graveyard. John is now empty-handed, puts down a sixth land, puts down another one of these three drops. We've seen those three drops in his opening hand. Tell us a little bit about what his draws have been. So John, you know, started a little bit slow, mm -hmm. ran out, started out with the Inventor's Apprentice, and then missed his third land drop. But if you noticed, the, if you looked at his hand, it was really powerful. A lot of these three drops, really strong, PNLR, Aethersphere Harvester, and the most important thing being those multiple copies of Unlicensed Disintegration, which allowed him to just continue to put pressure on Jeremy's life total. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look, John is currently looking at four points of damage in disguise, and then if he uses PNLR's ability, which can pump artifact creatures, he does have the mana to actually get in for seven points of damage. So if Jeremy taps out here for the Champion of Wits, he is dead on board. That's going to be PNLR, not a common ability here, but it is two mana. A target artifact creature gets plus O, or I'm sorry, plus one, plus O. Right. That's going to line up exactly for the win, if you just use this Inventor's Apprentice to get the Aethersphere Harvester in the sky. Yeah. So, I, I don't... Oh, wait! He found a Walking Ballista, so that's the free spell. I didn't think he could play anything. That gains him one life. So that puts him to eight, meaning John only has seven points of damage right now. So this is not, oh, not over no. yet. So Lightning Strike is, I suppose, in the realm of what we're looking for. Yeah. If you're John... Another disintegration. We've now got enough creatures in the graveyard. If it goes to next turn, we are looking at some 4-4s jumping into this fray. Right. 
Wow, the walking ballista. Did he have that in hand when he did that? I don't think so. I don't believe no, so. No, no, because if he did, he would have just run it out and then used the gate to find the God Pharaoh's gift. So. Yeah. He did get to look at four cards. Wow. So, six mana available. Cards that might do it. Hazard always is fun. Yeah. Glorybringer is always neat. And now if you look at kind of that play earlier where John Rolfe attacked with two of the Inventor's Apprentice with the Walking Ballista, mm -hmm. if he used the Walking Ballista, that would have allowed him to get in for one point of damage that turn. You're right. And that, that could have been the difference between winning or losing this match, or I this game specifically. It would have been only that Fanatical Firebrand standing between those two Inventor's Apprentices. Exactly. <laughs> the tiniest, the tiniest little thing. Taking a look at his mana base right now. He's like, I why think don't I have eight mana? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> now it's just a matter of he knows that there's six cards for Jeremy in the graveyard. I, it might just be a question of survival. It might just be a question of making it happen. He does have the capability of using the other ability of Pia potentially next turn, which allows him to uh, actually eliminate cards from being able to block. Right. And I don't think I see anything that directly gains life for Jeremy in his graveyard at the moment maybe an opportunity for uh, Jeremy in that sense. Yeah, so again, John can get Jeremy down to one life here, mm -hmm. and then will Jeremy actually be able to put enough creatures with flying onto the battlefield to maybe not, to not die on the following turn? Not that I can currently see. Right. I, maybe a combat celebrant uh, would also just help in having a massive swing, but I don't see a whole lot in the realm of that. It's definitely going to be up to Jeremy to kind of find this answer, because I think John is going to still follow the same line that you, you detailed out. Right, so this he can get Jeremy down to one here. Next turn, he, can, he has two flyers that attack, and he can even potentially make a, block not, uh, a creature not block. Mm -hmm. so. And John also opting to go for the lifelink on the Ether Square Harvester. He's going to be sitting at a pretty comfortable 22 life, so it's pretty unlikely that uh, he's going to die here. Looks like we might not be going for the full activation here huh only had the one activation we're down to three a backup pnlr okay so that actually does give us the other artifact to see the three ar flying uh creatures or if needed it does give you an additional creature to to throw and eliminate one of these blockers right i think we saw him kind of debating am i willing to lose this initial pia or do i want to just get Jeremy to, yeah, to John, one. John just choosing to, to go wide here. Mm -hmm. As long as that Pia Nilar stays on the battlefield, he, can now, he now has the option to kind of spread around the plus one plus zero effect from the Pia Nilar. So Jeremy really wants to find a way to... Well, it's weird. So he needs like flyers, but also a way to get that Pia Nilar off the board. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of, you know, the, the slight differences, right? If you were playing the blue-white Godfarer's gift deck, easy game. Just get an uh, uh, Angel of Invention out there on the battlefield, and uh, you know that's the game's pretty much over. But uh, attack for six, gain six, have vigilance, block, gain right. another six. But now it's God Pharaoh's gift, and trying to make it happen. Ooh, is this is this potentially lethal? Because it looks like he's going for double God Pharaoh's gift here. This might be. We had another gate to the afterlife. That one came down. Was able to activate each of them. This is both of the God Pharaoh's gifts. Does he have a celebrant in his graveyard? He does not. He's okay. got the firebrand. He does have the war kite marauder. He's got access to the walking ballista, the minister of inquiries, the champion of wits. Going for this okay, one so with let's the see, first ability. Does he find a celebrant off the champion? Because if he finds a celebrant off the champion. Again, it doesn't target, so that ability is still in the stack. He can There's find a celebrant. Anything. There's a celebrant. There's going to be another combat with another oh two God Pharaoh's gifts coming down. Wow. All of these other cards are going to untap. They're going to be attacking once more. John's Exert. only got the Inventor's Apprentice, only Jeez. got the Thopter. So he's going to get to do this again. Two more God Pharaoh's gift triggers after this attack. Does he have another Champion of Wits in the graveyard at all? I don't think so. I see... I see some Orkheim Rotters, a Minister, and a, a Ballista, I believe. Okay, because if there was another one, then... Oh, my goodness. So there's going to be another two triggers, another two <laughs> four fours on this battlefield. Yeah, does John have... I mean, John is, John is at 23. It, it's going to take a... It's an uphill yeah. battle, yeah. sure. Right. But this is just a colossal amount of damage, potentially. Right, because these creatures get to, uh, get to attack again. Maybe John is interested here in, in making setting up a block where he can get one of the creatures off the board so he can't attack again. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe there's another one. I think I s it's just the two ministers 
the walking blista and two. I of thought there those was a marauders. firebrand. Wasn't there a firebrand? Maybe not. Uh, you know I what? Actually, I think there was a firebrand. I just always assume that there's a firebrand in both players' graveyards. Yeah, we saw that one go after the walking blista earlier. So yeah. that one should be hanging out in the graveyard, maybe just floating underneath one of these. Yeah. So it looks like there's going to be a double block here. We have a two-two lining up with a and a two-three. So that gets rid of one of the eternalized creatures because they're all four fours. Mm -hmm. And then he can choose to put the thopper in front of one of the creatures just to kind of prevent damage. This means that he's going to take eight, go to fifteen. But keep in mind, there's another combat step with two more Godfarer's Gift triggers that are going to happen here. And these are already some 4 4 so those are presenting 8 damage without that Thopter. And this... This puts John down to 15, and then he gets two more creatures. They're all 4 4s. They're all 4 4s, but John can block, ju can block just one and survive. So maybe it's a situation where Jeremy's just trying to set up, get another two of these, and get maybe the Warkite Marauders to stand in the way of this Aethersphere Harvester. The PNLR is no longer out, so right. you so, can't so, give them the so, boost. So now Jeremy needs to get that flyer on the battlefield. I don't think he can actually attack with everything, no. but what he can do is have a Warkite Marauder on the battlefield, and now that the PNLR had to block and he got the PNLR off the board, Jeremy could actually just use the Warkite Marauder to block one of the, the, to block the Harvester and then only take two from the Thopters. And actually, I think he's got two of them in that graveyard. Oh, okay. So it might be actually be able to block both of these. No, it is going to be a fanatical firebrand that comes down. So a 4-4, four, yeah. four, one of them flying, standing in the way of this. This might be a situation where even finding something like... Uh, need a, a disintegration. Yeah. PNLR. Eliminating the flyer is a big name of the game right now. And, and I understand kind of the reason to play the PNLR last turn, but ma maybe he was dead if he didn't. No, no, he was definitely dead if, dead if he didn't, but... It would be real nice if he found if he had that PNLR this turn. Oh, and now Jeremy gets to untap, gets additional activations. Especially if there's any spells. Can you imagine if another combat celebrant gets in the graveyard this turn? <laughs> I don't even think he necessarily needs it at this point. Also, he can stack it so he gets the minister in play and and mill himself for three if he wants to potentially find a celebrant. I don't know if that's what he's going for. It looks like, yeah, it looks like that's what he's going for. So this is with the other God Pharaoh's Gift still on the stack. Right. Fanatical Firebrand is the find, does not find that Celebrant. And now he's going to go into that one. He's going to find another one of these cards to put on to the battlefield. But John, staring at a brick wall of these 4-4s. Four so now John, if he has another Marauder, he has the option of finding, of either putting the Marauder onto the battlefield or the Fanatical Firebrand. I don't know if he has another Aethersphere Harvester. He could get a Trophy Mage and search for uh, an Aethersphere Harvester and put that on the battlefield too. And think about the moments that led up to this. You mentioned the one earlier, not using that Walking Ballista to eliminate the blocker and get that one extra point of damage. Also, we saw a Champion of Wits come in, hit the Walking Ballista that he then used for zero to gain the one life. Yeah. to keep him alive. That, that had that to be in the top incredible. four. Yeah, the champion of Wits doing so much work for Jeremy here. That walking ballista for the extra point of life. We've got two of Finding these the combat in. celebrant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everything lined up. Okay, so Jeremy getting very aggressive here. Cannot pick the Aethersphere Harvester with cannot, this. Cannot. But cannot. interestingly... John's probably going to use one of these before that ability to resolves to activate the Aethersphere Harvester. Will not be able to do it after that ability resolves. Yeah, so John can activate the Aethersphere Harvester. Uh, if he does do that, though, I guess Jeremy does have the option of using the Fanatical Firebrand to finish off the Harvester, mm -hmm. but then he does lose his 4-4 four -four blocker uh, and I to think get the Harvester off the board. I think that was a good portion of what the, the game plan here was. But also, Jeremy's got eight untapped land. Yeah. There could be anything in that hand. Well, yeah, keep in mind, he did eternalize. A he did use Godfarer's Gift to get Champion of Wits onto the battlefield. So the two cards in his hand are just likely just very good spells. Yes. So we've got two blocks here. Looks like we're actually going to keep the Aethersphere so Harvester alive. I, I could see like a Walking Ballista maybe. Oh, no, okay. An Aethersphere Harvester for Jeremy. That does mean that there's now a flyer in the way and a Warkite Marauder, another flyer. John needs an unlicensed disintegration here. Finds that could do it. Sweltering Suns. That is... It's a cycle. No, you're going to cycle this. If he finds unlicensed disintegration, it's still lethal because there is no gate to the afterlife on the battlefield. It's two swamps. Uh. That's a handshake. Jeremy is going to take it down in two. 
Wow, so Jeremy is going to be 12 and 2 heading into the 15th round. Another one of these players who is in contention for this top eight slot. Yeah, and what an incredible game. I thought when he eternalized that, and when he tapped out for the champion wits, I was like, oh, well, he just, he's just dead. John just has lethal. Forgot that walking ballista. It just turns out a free life gain spell with Gate to the Afterlife on the battlefield. What, what an amazing game. A fantastic way to end this round 14. Round 15 coming your way after these messages.